Welcome to Fort Knox. I'm here uh, with Cristiano Amon, the CEO of Qualcomm. I am John Fort, as I always am. And uh, you've got some announcements uh, here uh, leading up to CES, a consumer electronics show. Quite a few of them, but the, the headline seems to be this full stack robotics platform. And even though we don't think necessarily of self-driving as being robotics, it really is. So I guess this isn't a brand new thing for you. No, look, we're incredibly excited in general, John. I think uh, uh, it's very, very good to see uh, what's happening with the company. I think the strategy that we put in place to diversify, to grow, uh, we can actually see the excitement. There's so many different things we have been doing. I think what you saw us, uh, you know, early in this year, there was a lot of uh, uh, conversations about what we're doing in data center and now robotics. This is a massive opportunity. Uh, as you said it correctly, uh, you, you mentioned about cars being physical AR, but the robot is very clear. Nobody will dispute that it's an edge AI platform. And I think that's right into our wheelhouse. We have the right to win. And at CES, we're kind of announcing not only an expansion of our roadmap for robotics, but some new customer engagement and the opportunity to go after this massive market opportunity with a full stack solution. Why is the opportunity so massive? My sense is that um, robotics has been relatively splintered up to this point. You've had some consumer companies going back to IBO and before, and then you know the the, uh, the attempts in robotic vacuums, iRobot and whatnot that have kind of flamed out uh, to some degree. But nothing, um, no, no platform that's been as uh, organized, robust as we've seen in technologies like the PC the smartphone and arguably the car? I think the fundamental technology difference, it's, it's physical AI. I think the same thing that we see, a, you know, AI fundamentally change. For example, I think I love the example you provided what happened with uh, a self-driving car and assisted driving. As, as we went from traditional, I think, machine learning, and you saw how the combination of that with with uh, AI and some generative AI systems, um, how you change, I think, the concept of training tasks, how you have a self-learning, I think, device. That technology is fundamental combined with now having the high-performance processing system uh, for those opportunities. And I think to answer your question, the opportunity is massive. We're really talking about, you know, there are a number of analyses showing by 2040 is a trillion dollar opportunity. But if you unpack that, it has consumer applications, you have a lot of industrial applications, and then you have, uh, you know, humanoids, uh, form factors. And the other way to look at this, just think about uh, healthcare, retail, uh, warehousing manufacturer. Today, if you look of a warehousing, if you go to an Amazon distribution center, you see a lot of robots moving, uh, you know, boxes and packages. And think about that doing at scale in retail. Think about that in healthcare. So the opportunity is significant. And now you have both the processing technology and the physical AI to make that happen. And I think for a company like Qualcomm that is sitting on the edge, uh, it's an incredible opportunity. The same exact reason that we were successful in automotive is what we believe we're going to be successful in, in robotics. So break down for me the elements of the stack and your strategic approach. Yes. So let's let's go back to some of the conversations we used to have about years ago when we talk about what we're going to do with the Snapdragon digital chassis and automotive. You could not put a server in the trunk of a car, and especially an electrical car. You could not put a server. You needed a high density of computing. You needed to integrate a number of different sensors. You needed to have different type of uh, uh, computing from computer vision uh, to, to CPUs, to GPUs, to neural processing units, and you had the ability to have something that meets the safety and industrial standards. And I think that's why I think no, there's no dispute at this point that uh, our approach was successful in the automotive industry. You get the automotive uh, problem statement which was a physical AI, and now let's just go take that to a humanoid robot. Everything that was true from the car is even more true for the robot. The robot 
needs a lot of battery life. You need to be incredibly efficiency in power. You need to integrate a lot of sensors. The robots has cameras, uh, has accelerometers, has a number of different sensors that needs to be integrated. And you need to have the scale of consumer electronics, which I think our DNA comes uh, from the phone space. You know, one thing is for you to do a $20,000 robot. The other thing is, can you make the robot a $5,000 robot or even cheaper? Can you make the battery, instead of lasting an hour or two hours, can it last for about eight hours? So that is, I think, the silicon expertise of Qualcomm, uh, that we actually build a dedicated platform uh, for robotics. And at CS, we announced the IQ10, which is probably the most advanced robotics uh, uh, platform that can go all the way to supporting humanoid robots. On top of it, we develop, I think, uh, the uh, software stack that you can apply uh, to different elements, including the integration of the sensors, how you, how you have the central computing and the brain of the robot. In the training mechanism and the ability to have the flywheel of AI data, which is also part of our solution, is very different than training a large language model, for example, in the cloud. Uh, when you think, for example, an industrial use case, you have to train the robot on the particular ta uh, task that you want the robot to do, and you perfect on that task. So it's a very well-defined uh, training problem, and it's the same approach, for example, that we use when we develop our own uh, ADAS stack, the training mechanism that you have on driving cars on the roads. So what's the ecosystem approach here i mean with cars you already have uh, a built-in uh, legacy of oems of drivers their habits by country by region etc in robots you're you're looking to enter spaces where there are tasks that either humans have been doing or tasks that haven't been getting done at all to what degree do you need to seed the innovation space do you need to even make some of these robots yourself in order to accelerate the market uh, to the point where it's available to you at the level you want it to be? Look, this is a great question. Uh, and I think that's what makes this uh, incredibly exciting. Because first of all, you have established uh, robotics companies. We are we're now in evaluation with some of the largest industrial robotics uh, companies that actually you see a lot of robots in manufacturing. And I think when you apply... When you apply AI to some robots, you make them mobile like AMRs. Uh, think about AMR with arms. Uh, those companies roadmap, they see a lot of opportunity for expansion within that space. And you already have an ecosystem at scale that you see in large uh, industrial robotics companies. The second part of it is uh, what you're starting to see happening with some of those new companies. They're building humanoids and they're building their own training environment. One of the incredible things we're excited about this uh, CS announcement of the IQ10 is Figure AI, a company that has been done a lot of advancements, humanoid robot, just decided they are going to design IQ10 in their humanoid robots. And you have companies like Vin Group in uh, Vietnam, their Motion 2 robot is now also being designed with Qualcomm Dragon Wing. And so those are new ecosystems that are forming. And then you have a multitude of consumer robots, um, opportunities that just get by enabling AI in, uh, in other devices. So we also seen an interesting leverage from uh, the ecosystem of industrial PCs, uh, companies like Adventech, for example, working with us and building platforms, and even some companies interested in developing uh, development kits like ARMS that you can uh, do a development kit on top of the platform to facilitate training and deployment. It's a, it's a new opportunity. It's starting to expand. I think you see there's a lot of activity into that. And I think we're very happy to be entering this space, I think, at this stage uh, right before, I think, the big growth curve. How do you incentivize developers, software developers, to work on top of your platform and create the kind of value that I imagine it would take to speed adoption here, whether it's through app stores, whether it's through open source means of being able to accelerate the software capabilities quickly enough that potential end customers see the value that much more quickly in adopting some of these potential robotic solutions? Look, this is a great question. And let me tell you a little bit what we're after. I think we're, we're 
where we're going to start to see a lot of the opportunities for us is going, especially when you think about leveraging the software ecosystem, is going to be in uh, an enterprise of industrial deployments because that it's a it's a well it's a finite software application that you're going to train a robot for a particular tasks. So you provide a developer, uh, you know, platform uh, with the uh, training abilities. We're actually going to show at, at within CS. You will see a lot of uh, uh, you know training uh, uh, rigs uh, for industrial companies to use. Even leveraging things like uh, existing ecosystem of VR, and you train a robot on that task. The other part, which is more the consumer, like, like the general purpose robot that you do everything. That's a much more complex uh, uh, training environment. And I think the partnerships that we're going to have with companies like Google, as an example, and many others that are building, uh, you know, platform for robotics. I think that's how this is going to develop over time. And I'm going to do a parallel with you. Assisted driving, for you to have different levels of assisted driving, when you still have the driver behind the wheel, it's a much more finite uh, training problem than a robo taxi that you don't have to even have a steering wheel. And I think that's a good proxy when you think about uh, a consumer robot, they will do everything. Uh, they will need a very, very large ecosystem versus an enterprise application that you train a robot for a particular task on a retail, like pick and place on the shelf or in a healthcare uh, for prescription distribution or things like that. And I think the opportunity, uh, it's, it's already materializing and us starting with industrial companies seem to be the fastest path to revenue. Okay, pivoting now to the PC uh, ecosystem. You got a little update there. Tell me uh, what you've got to announce new at CES. Yes, uh, we continue to move forward uh, with our expansion into PC. And at CES, we're announcing the X2 Plus platform. We we recently announced the X2 Elite, which is, I think, the second generation premium platform. The X2 Plus is actually designing to scale the platform with creators and professionals. It's our, it's our platform to start getting traction and volume into the commercial PC with uncompromised AI. I continue to be very optimistic especially when you think about Microsoft recent announcement, now new agents on Windows, that platform is designed for that market with a price points uh, that are going to enable commercial. Uh, and it's another step in our journey, I think, uh, to gain traction. Uh, since the last time we spoke, we have about 150 designs now across all the major OEMs, and there will be at CS new laptops announced with X2+. Plus. And you've also, um, uh, you're talking about digital chassis uh, a bit as well. Uh, CES has become a bit of a car show over the yes. past 20 years uh, or so. Well, what's new there or what are you updating? Yeah, look, I like that you said that. I think it's probably one of the biggest car shows in the world right now. And hopefully soon will be a robotics show as well. But, uh, you know, talking about cars, as as we have been saying, that's one of the brightest spots of the Qualcomm growth and diversification. Our automotive business continue to gain traction, continue to win. We, As you know, we've been working with virtually every uh, car company in the world, um, building what you said. We had built an ecosystem. We're very proud. And what we're talking about CS, we have 10 new global design wins uh, with the Snapdragon uh, digital chassis elite platform. What that means is that continues to increase the pipeline as we continue to translate this into revenue. We just had our first billion dollar quarter. We're on track to get 8 billion of automotive revenues by 2029. And there's more. I think we have at the show, we're announcing uh, more uh, besides those 10 new global design wins, more par partnerships with some of the largest uh, car makers. We're also announcing uh, a lot of deployment that has been commercialized with our Flex platform that has both uh, the digital cockpit as well ADAS in the same chip. And we are going to talk about more traction with uh, ADAS, which is a growth area for Qualcomm. A lot has changed since my very first CES 25 years ago when Bill Gates unveiled the Xbox at the Las Vegas Hilton, and we were using WAP browsers to uh, try to find out what was going on around Vegas. This was this was before Qualcomm took over 
uh, took over mobility entirely. Look, uh, we, we keep changing, and it's good that we both witness all of those changes, but uh, uh, it, that says a lot about how long we've been in the industry, but, uh, but this is good. I think, as I said in the beginning, we can feel the excitement within Qualcomm. It's a different company right now. There's a lot of new things that we're doing, and uh, robotics is our next frontier. Physical AI, quite a way to kick off the year. Cristiano Amon, CEO of Qualcomm. Thanks for joining me on Fort Knox.